Okay. Um, I'll just take that as yes. Um, let me share my screen. So, um, right, we've covered covariance matrices. So, um, and we've discussed them now during the, the break at, at quite some length, uh, which, was, which was fun. Um, now, uh, we're talking about what is this L? So L is the likelihood function. And so that's, um, uh, that, that's, an, that's an easy uh, description. The likelihood function of the data given the model and given the covariance matrix. But how does it actually look like, right? If I were to just give you this equation, you could probably come up with something for this, right? You go to an MCMC and you get some kind of a um, posterior, but you would not necessarily know how to implement this. So the likelihood function itself is frequently assumed to be a multivariate Gaussian, but it doesn't have to be. Um, there is a reason to believe that this approximation is, well, I mean, it, it's, it's actually very clear that it's not, um, that it's not correct. Um, but the question is how bad is this approximation? So why do people assume a multivariate Gaussian? Well, it's pretty easy. It has some very nice mathematical properties. And to be very honest, if we were to pick something more complicated, it would be very hard for us to do inference. Um, but there are other ideas out there like Bayesian approximate computation, um, um, uh, approximate Bayesian computation, ABC, um, or other forward modeling ideas that do not make assumptions about the functional form of the likelihood, that just look at the model, look at the data, look at the covariance matrix, because it is still important, even if you don't have a likelihood, it's still important for you to know what are the uh, statistical uncertainties and what are the um, uh, correlations of the data points. And then you just compare data and model in the presence of a covariance matrix through something else than the likelihood function. Um, so, now, why is this not a multivariate Gaussian? Well, I mean, let's look at let's look at the CMB, where actually the multivariate Gaussian is a pretty good approximation. Um, uh, so, in 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 CMB, uh, if we look at the um, uh, C of Ls, right? So, so basically Fourier modes on the sky with temperature power spectrum. Um, we know that the temperature field itself is uh, kind is distributed is well approximated by a Gaussian, right? That is pretty Gaussian. But um, but going but there is no reason that if a quantity a is distributed as a Gaussian, the correlation function of that quantity should also be distributed as a Gaussian. In fact, it's not. It's usually uh, distributed as a it is distributed as a as a Wishart distribution. And um, uh, now there is some central limit theorem that you can invoke on uh, if, if you bin the temperature power spectrum and if you go to sufficiently small L's, um, uh, large L's, sorry, small scales, um, you can say that within those bins you have lots and lots of independent realizations and you can make the argument, okay, uh, central limit theorem, lots of independent realizations, whatever this inverse Wishart is, it will approximate to a, a multivariate Gaussian because I just have so many of them. That works, but if you go to L below of like 50, 40, so to large scales, you don't have enough realizations anymore. And so if you go to the Planck papers, um, they on, on very small L, so on large scales, they do have a different functional form. They actually have um, a, a inverse Wishart um, distribution that is being assumed there. Now, in the case of galaxy redshift surveys, the situation is even worse because we know that the galaxy density field or the shear field, if you look at weak lensing, is not Gaussian on small scales, right? I mean, it's highly non-Gaussian because of non-linear evolution at late times. So already that is violated. On top of that, you have the violation of, um, uh, of, of then taking a two-point statistic on a quantity that is already not Gaussian. So the two-point statistic is, well, we don't know anymore. Um, and the only thing that saves you again is the argument of the central limit theorem, right? We're not going to super large scales on uh, in, in, in cosmic shear or in um, galaxy clustering. I mean, definitely nothing like L of, 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 of five or 10, nothing like that. So again, the idea is, okay, whatever this likelihood function is, we have so many realizations within each bin of theta that it might approximate 
to a uh, univariate Gaussian within each bin. Um, and then if we look at the whole data vector, well, let's just hope that these, uh, 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 that the combination of these multiple univariate distributions or uh, univariate Gaussians uh, will be a multivariate Gaussian, that the approximation still holds for the multivariate case. So this is a topic that um, is interesting to explore if you're interested in inference and likelihood uh, uh, functional forms um, and in, in analytical calculations. There's a couple of interesting papers that happened uh, 2018 to 2020. I think the verdict is still somewhat out on how important it is. My personal um, uh, endeavor and, and exploration in this regard has, has kind of shown that at least for weak lensing for cosmic shear, it is not such an important effect if you assume uh, the functional form to be Gaussian compared to other uh, um, assumptions that you can make. So here is an example. This is actually the multivariate Gaussian functional form. So you have the, um, this is the likelihood of the data given a certain model. I've split the model here into cosmological parameters and nuisance parameters. So the likelihood is governed by these parameters and by the covariance matrix. And so in the multivariate case, it can be described as e to the minus one half data minus model. These are all vectors, transposed covariance, inverted, data minus model. So that's what's commonly referred to as time squared. Um, now, what we can do, and that's what, what I've done here some long time ago, and there's um, other papers out there uh, on this topic, is actually we can go to numerical simulations, right? Because we're interested in what is the distribution of our summary statistic, of our shear shear correlation function. That is the summary statistic. So we can just simulate the universe uh, a thousand times. So we run a thousand numerical simulations and we compute. Uh, the correlation function for each of these numerical simulations and then we just draw a histogram. So this is the histogram that I um, got for a very specific theta value. I think this was for five arc minutes for a redshift at two. Um, this was the distribution of all the correlation data points. So that's just one data point. Right? Um, and uh, the blue curve here shows uh, the fit if I were to assume it was a Gaussian and the red curve uh, shows the best fit. I got through some, some KDE. And this is a QQ plot that shows you uh, uh, deviations from uh, the assumption of a Gaussian uh, likelihood. And um, yeah, so I did this for a couple of different angular separations, different redshifts um, for Psi plus, Psi minus. And I've uh, shown this to some statisticians um, and the, the most, uh, uh, well, the most important thing that I remember about the, the comment that I got was like, well, I've approximated way worse QQ plots with a Gaussian. So some, um, tells you something about, um, uh, statisticians and they were just based on, on these histograms thinking that, okay, I don't, I don't think that the, the multivariate, that the Gaussian, the multivariate Gaussian is a bad approximation in this case. This has been studied further um, uh, with, with more simulations and the results, um, I, I, I think the final verdict on this is still somewhat, somewhat out, but in the presence of all the other statistical uncertainties and systematic uncertainties that we have, uh, the approximation of the likelihood function as a multivariate Gaussian does not seem to be too strong of an approximation in the case of shear shear, um, in my opinion. I will say right now that others in the community have different opinions. Okay, um, so putting this all together, now we have all the ingredients that we need. We have a prior CMB or supernovae in the case of a, a galaxy clustering uh, large scale structure survey. We have our likelihood, the functional form. We assume that it is a multivariate Gaussian or we assume some other parameterization. Um, or we go for non-parametric forms, which is something like approximate Bayesian computation. Um, we need a forward modeling framework that can give us a large model vector that has the exact same binning as our large data vector. And that needs to be able to self-consistently forward model the observables as a function of cosmological parameters and nuisance parameters. 
And nuisance parameters describing systematics are usually much uh, larger in dimension compared to cosmological parameters. We um, also need a covariance matrix. So the covariance matrix, as we've seen, is usually large, it's complicated, it's a um, non-diagonal covariance matrix. And as we've discussed in the break, there's different methods for its derivation. And all of them have kind of have, have advantages and disadvantages. And in order to get a um, trustworthy covariance matrix, it is actually useful to combine them, to cross-check, and to make sure that any residual uncertainties in the covariance matrix computation are not the dominant source of changes when you run the likelihood analysis itself. <clears throat> so what do you do, uh, what do you have to do in, in order to assure that? Well, you actually have to build a framework that combines external observations, simulations, and theory, especially for the covariance matrix. The um, um, combination of all three is needed in order to cross-check your covariance matrix. Well, actually for the data vector, the, um, uh, all three of these are needed as well. So it's really important to create an information loop between observations and simulators because sometimes they talk to each other, sometimes they don't. Theorists, they don't like to talk to any of these, but um, uh, if you are running a, a larger survey, you actually have to make sure that they all talk to each other um, in order to get the model vector right, in order to get the covariance matrix right. Okay. Um, um, this is a good breakpoint, so I quickly want to ask if there are questions about how to run a likelihood analysis for this particular case, and it is similar for many other cases. 3D power spectra, right, you just have a different model vector, you have a different covariance matrix. Um, so if you want to do this for DESI, there are, of course, subtleties that are different, but conceptually it's the same. Uh, yeah, we assume that uh, um, the likelihood function is Gaussian in, uh, in the summary statistic or in the difference thereof, yeah. Any other questions? I'm sorry, I should probably see. Ah, oh, there's a question, Divya. So in the last plot, when you're talking about the shear, uh, there was a Gaussian fit and uh, there was a fit and a Gaussian approximation to the likelihoods, right? Uh, this one. So in all the yes. cases, the red peak is always lagging behind the blue one. Is there a reason or it's just... Uh... Um, let me think. I mean, so, so these, are not, uh, these are not all the plots, right? I mean, this is just for uh, three different theta values. And the uh, top row is for Xi plus, and the lower row is, I think, for Xi minus. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so the, um, I, I think it is fair to say that it's somewhat skewed to the left, yeah. I've seen that multiple times, but I would not um, commit to the statement that that's always true for any scale and for any redshift. Yeah, I mean, it's, it looks um, it's quite smooth. You can see the difference. I mean, I thought because it's a fit, so it's sometimes it should lag behind and sometimes it would have been a lag forward, right? Uh, it's a best fit. That's what that's I right. would have expected. So that's why I asked. Yeah, no, they are they are different by eye, no doubt. Um, the question is, does this difference matter in the likelihood analysis in comparison to all the other approximations that that one makes? Yes. Um, but it's it's also very 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 clear that if you want to improve on this, you would do something like an Edgeworth expansion. You would try to introduce some kind of skewness, perhaps, to the likelihood that does mimic this. Um, but you know, once you, at any point in time when you introduce these corrections, you have to be sure that you don't do any harm uh, compared to doing, to, to what you're doing good, right? There is, um, yeah, that's a generic statement. But yes, there is ways how to improve that. Edgeworth expansion is one idea, non-parametric uh, uh, likelihood inference is, is another one. More Thank questions you. on this? Thank you. Check the chat. Okay.
Um, okay, any other question related to any of these topics, putting it all together? Uh, how do we have a question about the Gaussian distribution thing? So, uh, according to like what Dragon said, like it's kind of it's partially dependent on the uh, central limit theorem that the distribution is approximately Gaussian. So it doesn't mean the larger the survey area is, the better it um, approximates Gaussian distribution. Um, yes, in, in, in part, yes. So the, the quantity that's relevant here is for two-point correlation functions, how many, um, um, how many data points, individual, how many individual measurements do you have per bin? Right? So if you look at a, a bin that goes from, say, five arc minutes to 10 arc minutes, right? and you represent that with a representative of 7.5 arc minutes, which you should, but let's just assume. Um, there's many galaxy pairs that go into that bin. And the more, go into, uh, the more galaxy pairs that you have in, in that bin, the more realizations you have, the more likely it is that the distribution of that bin is a multivariate Gaussian. Okay. So, sure. So, um, um, so, so that improves, of course, when you increase the survey area. But it also... Um, um, uh, gets more and more problematic if you're interested in larger scales, right? So, for example, if you're interested in scale-dependent bias for primordial non-Gaussianity, you go to really large scales, you might be in trouble uh, with that assumption. Uh, that's, that's, that's the trade space. So, um, if, you, if you confine yourself to small scales and you have lots of them, lots of realizations, you should be good. Okay, um, thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Um, so while this likelihood topic sounds very interesting, it is also hard. It's a hard problem, and I'm not sure if it will pay off in terms of you will find a big effect. Um, it is interesting to think about, but I would not choose this as my super priority project right now. You should have a safe project in addition to that project. Um, OK. So, uh, so this question came up. Um, what is blinding? So um, I, I, I thought it might be useful to discuss uh, blinding concepts in the context of, of um, cosmological inference in general, and uh, also to trigger some thoughts and discussion. And this is going to be the end of the first lecture, so we will not even get to the second lecture, but that's okay. Um, I will just uh, squash that into the third lecture. Um, so what is blinding? And uh, blinding is tightly um, connected to experimenter bias. So the idea being that you have some preconditioned idea about what should come out of your experiment, right? So there's some people out there in the community who think, well, Lambda CDM has to be the true um, underlying model. And so um, when I analyze my data, there is no need for me to, to um, to blind myself anyhow because I already know what comes out of it, right? This is a horrible attitude to go into uh, an experiment because you go in there with a strong expectation and that strong expectation will influence your results. That's not what you want, right? You have uh, paid a lot of money or invested a lot of time into collecting these, um, uh, these, these data products. You want to uh, know what's the truth, right? You want to know what's the true physics. So you have to design your inference process free of any kind of um, external um, uh, biases. So this is an example where, um, a famous example out of particle uh, physics, where we're looking at the measurement of the neutrino lifetime as a function of time. So this ranges from 1960 to 2010. And you can see that, okay, there was a first experiment over here. Um, a second experiment, a third experiment, and they all kind of agree. And why do they agree? Because somebody here made a very good experiment that kind of set the scale for the coming years. And probably there was a very strong you know, incentive not to disagree with this experiment necessarily. Right? It has quite large error bars. But then if you look at the paradigm shift that happened here in the 1970s, you have a new type of experiment coming around, a new generation of experiment coming around, uh, 
um, and suddenly these are actually quite in tension. So there's something going on with these error bars first and foremost, and then second of all, why do these three measurements agree so perfectly? And then suddenly there's that drop. And this goes on and goes on and goes on. And then again, another set of experiments uh, uh, happens, finding uh, uh, a different neutrino lifetime with a very different, uh, um, very different uh, error bar as well. And the story repeats itself. So it seems to happen, this plot seems to indicate that as long as you don't have a vastly superior experiment, you kind of tend to try not too much to be in tension with the previous experiment. Um, because only here this uh, drop has occurred and you can easily imagine, okay, this was a big endeavor. Um, uh, people were sufficiently confident that they would have the best experiment so they didn't see any problem by being in tension with the four uh, going experiments. What tells us, uh, what this tells us is basically that, that uh, human nature and human expectation can sometimes influence the outcome of your experiment. And so you want to shield against the so-called experimental bias. And so you will, um, your, your, um, it is a very good idea to um, design your survey such that it is blind to yourself, to the experimenter, him or herself. Um, right, okay. So why do we want to have blind analyses? Well, um, Experimenters bias can be as subtle as, you know, choice of data samples. For example, if you say, ah, oh, we'll just do these galaxies because for those I really know um, uh, how, how to do my measurement. Uh, so selection choices, right? If you start selecting based on the outcome, that is an, a bias. Um, choice of priors and evaluation of systematics. Um, decision when to stop and when to publish. And this stopping criteria is, is one of the most important ones when talking about um, uh, blind analyses. So frequently, uh, if, you, uh, if you look at the data too early, right, you will continue to refine your data analysis until it looks good. But looking good is something that you've been conditioned on, right? It's something that uh, 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 is, is dependent on your expectation. So it is important not to look at the data or to have the data being blinded. Now, uh, I know that's a question for later, so I'm, I'm not going to answer that right now. But the decision when to stop working and publish should not be contingent on the experiment's outcome. And to be very specific, if we're talking about DES and Planck, there is a, let's call it minor tension that we found in the year one data. Now, we have a sophisticated blinding um, uh, technique for the year three data, and that has been um, uh, installed specifically because we do not want to refine our analysis, you know, tweak priors, change scale cuts, um, change the covariance matrix until we agree with Planck. So we will not know where our contours are in parameter space until everything is set in stone, nothing can be changed anymore, and then we unblind. That's going to be a very exciting telecon, and I look forward to that. Because it's usually a live script that runs through. Nobody knows what the outcome is, and then you just see the final contour overlapping with plan. It's really exciting and scary. Um, so I wanted you to, do, um, uh, to think and discuss well, mostly to think. Um, what are the pros of um, um, of blinding your data? What are um, the cons of um, blinding your data? Um, why? Because there are um, uh, problems when you blind, right? Um, this designing a uh, a blinding scheme that still lets you find systematic effects in your data, because you do want to fine tune your your data analysis. Um, but you don't want to bias yourself. Um, those, that's, that's an important balance and it's a difficult, difficult balance. So please think about that, post some comments, raise your arm and share your opinion. I'd be very happy also to hear an opinion that blinding is unnecessary. I'm very happy to discuss that. Or at least why blinding can be harmful. <laughs>
And I'm going to look at the chat now. Yeah, blinding can be harmful. Too much of it could be harmful. And I would like to carve out when, when that is. So do you, for example, do you have examples? Um, how would you blind a weak lensing data set? How would you blind a galaxy clustering data set? Ah, scale the shear, yeah. Well, if you scale the shear, you um, uh, for for weak lensing specifically, uh, it's 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 tricky. So how how exactly do you do you scale the shear, and can you still do all the null tests uh, on your data? But yes, scaling the shear is actually a part of the blinding structure uh, in 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 weak lensing. Is there a problem with blinding if you have to ignore a large percentage of your data? That's an interesting concept. So many um, uh, or several blinding schemes uh, work as follows. They allow everything on a small subset of the data for you to look at and understand the data. And then you move to the actual main data set. It's not necessarily my preferred way of, um, of doing blinding, but it does exist. Yes. Yes, for starters, it can be hard to do blinding and um, it is much more costly and time consuming and that is a huge drawback. I agree with that. And depending on how you design your blinding strategy, um, that can, it might just take too long, right? So then you have to redesign it. Yes. Could the blinding, ah, that's very interesting. Could the blinding methods be impacted by the experimenter's bias too? Yes, it's hard, yeah. I mean, I have trouble thinking about a specific example. But I would not exclude that possibility. I mean, clearly you're defining a process and that process is, um, that process can lead lead to to certain outcomes more likely than to others, so there is a bias in that. But blinding by hiring statisticians who don't know and are not interested in cosmology to do the analysis. Okay, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do that. Um, I've worked with too many statisticians to do that. <laughs> Okay, does anybody want to quickly share some thoughts verbally? Instead of me reading the chat. Come on, one person who is a blinding aficionado or critique. Shabazz, thank you. Hi, thanks. Hi. Uh, so it's just a comment. I'm not, um, I'm not, uh, I, I guess I'm not experienced enough to put this in a pro or a con in this in this particular area. So it, I mean, in the way that you explained in your previous slide, I mean, the, the various motivations to 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 blind or not to blind and the, to make the choice sounds more like an art of balancing different different reasons, right? I guess maybe that's the same for every decision that you make in life. I guess, <laughs> but I mean, um, it's. I certainly see the scientific point of it for sure, right? In the sense that um, I've attended different um, discussions about how certain, uh, like you mentioned as well, that certain people say that Lambda CDM is so absolutely beautiful that it has to be true. And that closes up to the idea of something else. Uh, so I see the scientific point of it, um, but at the same time, I don't, I don't really, uh, I'm not really sure about how can you blind, I mean, the scheme of it. And um, I'm, not, I'm not able to imagine the scheme of, scheme of blinding something, I mean, in the sense of uh, what you're saying. I don't know if that uh, conveys my point or I'm just really thinking out really loud. <laughs> right. 
No, no, no. These are these are all good points. Um, and and what you say is absolutely true. That um, designing designing a blinding scheme is kind of an art. You have to think about it. You cannot just um, I don't know arbitrarily multiply the data by a factor and put that factor into some um, fiduciary's box and then later you know multiply the contours. That's that's not how it works. Um, because for for various reasons, right? First of all, if you apply something to the data. Um, that might propagate very non-linearly into all the systematics tests that you've carefully designed. And so for that reason, you should, um, yeah, you have to think very, very carefully about what do you do to the data and how does that affect the null test. Um, on the other hand, uh, the, um, the idea that you go to the end of your analysis and you look at, let's say, the signal right, of, of the actual information content itself and you 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 see oh my god this is scattered everywhere there needs to be we we go back and we refine the um raw data analysis pipeline and then you look at the signal again the correlation function and now it looks more smoothly and then you stop that is not very good as well so you have to carefully design a suite of null tests that do not refine based on expected outcome in the signal itself i mean the worst case scenario is if you just pipe your data through to the analysis, uh, to the posterior, I mean, and you compare to other um, uh, uh, precursor data sets, right? And then you go back and you find, oh, okay, there was a bug in my code. I'm so sorry. Um, fix the bug, do the same again. And at some point, your stopping criteria is when you agree. And that's a very bad stopping criteria for finding bugs in your pipeline. So a blinding strategy is actually a very carefully designed bug finding strategy throughout all aspects of your analysis, theory, modeling, data reduction, um, all sorts of intermediate estimation processes, photo Z shear calibration, et cetera, you name it. All of these have different null tests. And you have to ask yourself, is this null test um, something that I can do blindly or is this already a null test that is too close to what I actually want to measure. Um, and then let's say the easiest uh, uh, blinding strategy later on is you should not plot your axes on the contours when you run it for the first time. You have to have a very, um, a very clear strategy or a very clear um, procedure in place. What happens if I see my results for the first time? right? Because once you see them, they don't agree and you go back and fine tune something, your data suddenly has much less credibility, at least in the particle physics world. If your experiment has not been blind, actually it is as harsh as nobody will really believe what, you're, what, you're, what, you, found, what you found out. So it's important to be very clear and you should write that in the paper even, I think. Um, this is my blinding strategy. These are my null tests and I iterate on them. I find bugs in my overall pipeline based on these null tests. And then for the first time, when I actually look at the result, if I do anything a posteriori, I will thoroughly document that in the paper. Because it, in my opinion, we're now in the opinion realm. There's no true, true or, 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 or false here. Um, in my opinion, you should, of course, be allowed to do stuff uh, uh, to investigate your data further afterwards, but you have to be clear in the paper up to here it was blind and afterwards it was no longer blind. And you should very much keep in mind that people will trust results that you've obtained blindly much more compared to things that you've obtained later when you went back and you iterated on uh, based on the fact that you found something unexpected. Um, but I would like to hear uh, people's uh, opinion on this and other opinions, perhaps even um, contradictory opinions. Let me look at the chat. Are the blinding methods scientifically verified to actually prevent bias, or is it just assumed that they work? That's a very good question. Um, so I'm going to go with definitely, um, I would subscribe to that it is common sense that they will remove 
bias. It is definitely scientifically documented that these experimental biases exist. So whether blinding now removes that, I'm not sure if that has been documented or whether that is mostly just an assumption. Um, so you could, um, yeah, I, I agree that one could make a comparison of, um, of um, experiments where blinding has been, been applied, like over a large range of, of, of time and where it hasn't been applied to see whether the data actually fluctuates in a statistical meaningful sense if you blind and whether it does not fluctuate as in this example here, right? There's no reason why these data points, even just by pure statistics, they should not be on the same level here. Same as here. These are independent experiments. They should not be on the same level. Otherwise something's wrong between the scatter of these points and the error bar. Right? So you could do this for a blinded uh, uh, set of experiments and see whether these fluctuations are more real. And I don't know if that's been done. Very good question. Um, would blinding and unit tests be beneficial to combine in one framework? Yes. Um, so, so unit tests are, um, um, so unit tests, as far as I know, are mostly things that apply to your code framework, uh, things uh, where you compartmentalize your code into different aspects and where you run uh, unit tests on the individual bits and pieces and then make sure that once you replace one of the individual bits and pieces and run this test that the overall framework still works. I'm not sure if unit tests are also uh, referred to in the context of um, of data analysis, um, uh, like where you run a null test on, on the data itself, right? Where you look at does my shear signal scale as a function of redshift as, you know, I would have expected. Um, I don't think that would be called a unit test, but it would be called a, a, a null test rather. Um, but yes, unit tests are part of a, a good blinding strategy. That's how you develop your code, and that is part of a good um, debugging strategy, which yeah, which is blinding. Um, could blinding itself be biased? Yeah, we. Uh, this this came up before. Um, I don't really see it. You would have to. Why don't you come up with an example that makes this more concrete? And uh, uh, I, I don't really see it, but I can. I can't also present an immediate argument why why this is not the case. Um, okay, I am fifteen minutes over time already. Even though that was just the first lecture, uh, I quickly wanted to recap this. So. What have we done today? We've introduced the basic ingredients for cosmological data analyses, mostly in the context of what um, uh, we defined as a three cross two point analysis. So combining weak lensing and galaxy clustering. But the concepts that were discussed here apply to any kind of data vector that you come up with. It is uh, equally true for if you want to do cluster number counts, if you want to do void lensing, if you want to do void number statistics, if you want to do three point functions, you can put all of that in your data vector as long as you can calculate the covariance matrix. And as long as you can predict that data vector as a function of systematics and cosmological parameters. Um, so, so these concepts are generally applicable and are not just for photometric surveys, equally for spectroscopic surveys, CMB surveys, you name it. Um, we've discussed how we uh, calculate uh, uh, model vectors, how we compute error models through covariance matrix. We've discussed the likelihood function and we've also discussed blinding concepts. So all together, this actually gives you an overview of how inference with cosmological data is done. And in the next lecture, um, we'll discuss uh, systematics and we'll also uh, actually have a look at, at the public DES year one data and we'll run a simple MCMC constraining galaxy bias and shear calibration, which are two of the most important systematics um, that we have. We'll use the actual data in order to, to constrain those. All right, um, I think I'll stop here, but I'm happy to hang around and ask, uh, answer questions that people might have regarding slides. Thank you.
Thank you, Tim. Let me stop the recording. Um, thank you very much. So I, I suggest, well, if, if you want,